Again, I'm Ryan Cordell, I'm an associate professor in the English department at Northeastern University, core founding faculty member in the new lab for text maps and networks, which is our center for digital humanities and computational social sciences. Um, today, I'm doing something that's a little bit odd for me as an English professor, which is to say that I'm reporting on work that's already done. This is not what we typically do at our conferences. We report on work in progress. But I was talking to David Smith, my collaborator, and he said, well, this is what computer scientists always do. So it felt very normal to him. David is on sabbatical uh, this year, and so he's not able to join me here. But I wanted to say that the, the work I'm describing was uh, a joint project between David and I. Um, you will see in, in moments in the report that there are definitely more sort of uh, elements of it that I authored. There are elements of it that he primarily authored. I'm going to try and translate as best as I can all of that to you all. Um, and then I also wanted to say uh, Bill Quinn, who is a PhD student in the English department at Northeastern, was also very important uh, to the work that we did. Uh, the project was funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation um, and also supported uh, by the New Lab uh, as we were working on it last year. So, the report that I'm talking about, it, it comes out of conversations that we uh, now know were happening among lots of different groups, including the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Library of Congress. And essentially, as they were talking about a lot of the uh, digital humanities and other projects that they had been funding over the past few years, they noticed that their grantees were reporting over and over again having some of the same problems with the, the optical character recognition in um, uh, underneath the, the, the data for a lot of the text mining and other sorts of projects that were being done. They were noticing that not only were they com were lots of project members reporting delays and, and even uh, questions that they were unable to answer because of the OCR, but that a lot of the problems they were reporting were the same problems, and that essentially this wheel felt like it was just being reinvented over and over and over again, or um, couldn't be invented over and over and over again in lots of different projects. And so they were interested in uh, writing a report to try and sum up sort of where, where are we? W where is OCR these days for humanistic materials in particular? Um, what are the kind of common struggles that lots of researchers and others are facing? Um, and what are steps that could be taken in the future to begin to address some of these common struggles? I will say the, the theme you're going to hear over and over uh, in this talk really resonates with a lot of what Kathleen was just talking about, which is to say a lot of this has to do with different communities talking together, working together, who have not been um, in the past. So um, anyway, they uh, reached out um, to, to David and I, and I'll explain why they reached out to David and I, and said, uh, who would be a good uh, person to write such a report? And essentially, we sort of self-servingly say, well, why don't we do it? And I'll explain why, uh, why we said that here in a second. But before I go too far, I'm going to assume that in this room, probably most people understand what OCR is, but I also don't want to just sort of barrel ahead as if everyone does, in case there's someone here who's not quite sure what I'm talking about. Um, but really briefly, um, I really like actually Rose Hawley's uh, sort of plain language definition of OCR. I think it's one of the best out there. My own attempt at something like that, optical character recognition, is a type of artificial intelligence software which is designed to mimic the functions of the human eye and brain to discern what marks on an image represent letter forms or other markers of written language. So essentially we have an image, a scan, and we want to know what text is on that and turn that into computer processable text data. Uh, typically, OCR is used in situations where manual tra transcription would be too costly or time consuming. So often in like large scale archival projects, things like uh, Chronicling America, the Library of Congress's newspaper collection, and in fact a lot of different newspaper collections, but also uh, Hathi Trust, Google Books, like big collections. Um, uh, part of um, my interest in this is that a, a huge amount, essentially, of human humanistic research these days uh, relies on OCR, even when uh, humanity scholars are not always very conscious of the fact that they're, they're using that data. Okay, so we tend really only to think about OCR, at least humanity scholars tend to primarily think of OCR when it, when it breaks or when we notice problems with it. And we don't tend to think about it or engage with it when it's working as we would expect or when we don't realize that it's breaking, I guess. Um, so some notable projects that uh, use OCR, things like the Trove newspaper, uh, 
collection uh, I've already mentioned. Sorry, the, there are notable projects that are trying to improve OCR. So if we think of the Trove uh, newspaper collection in uh, Australia, they have a crowdsourced transcription uh, element to that project where uh, citizen scientists can sort of come to Trove. They can decide to manually transcribe certain portions of the text and improve the OCR. There are also things like the Text Creation Partnership, which is working to improve the transcription of early modern uh, texts that were scanned. Um, but a lot of these approaches uh, we find don't, don't scale as we might imagine. Like the Trove newspaper archive, they've had millions and millions of lines of text manually transcribed, but when you look at those lines in comparison to the total number of lines that are in the whole archive, it's really quite a minute portion. And so uh, part of what we were sort of thinking about coming into this project are what kinds of things could be done at scale that might help to address some of these issues. So uh, yeah, in July 2013, 100 million lines of text, for instance, have been corrected in Trove, which does sound like a big number, but uh, across 21 million newspaper uh, pages, that ultimately ends up being a, a pretty small uh, proportion of the total. All right, so you can see um, some of this, right? They, <laughs> this is essentially what the the uh, Trove interface looks like for doing that correction. They do have these amazing like community things, like the, the Hall of Fame, to sort of recognize the people who are, are contributing an enormous amount of, of data to that. All right. So why why are why did David and I why are we interested? Um, as a David is trained as a computational linguist, primarily is in the computer science college at Northeastern. Again, I'm in the English department. Uh, a lot of our interest came out of the research that we've been doing together over the past seven years. Um, the most prominent example of this is the viral text project. So um, I work on 19th century newspapers, and uh, I started working with David on this project, which aims to uh, uncover the ways that stories and, and other texts were reprinted in 19th century papers. So we use data mining to automatically find uh, the duplicate sections of text across uh, archives. We started with Chronicling America, we're now working with a lot of archives, um, and more recently that project has expanded to a kind of global scope. We we're working with a Six Nation team to look at uh, reprinting across languages and across translation um, using not only American archives but also international archives of historical newspapers. So a lot of our methods for detecting reprints um, are about the sort of fuzzy boundaries required to find matches. Um, the, the texts were changed in the 19th century as they circulated. Editors changed them around, and so there's some instability there. But also, obviously, when things are scanned and OCR'd, the OCR changes the text uh, quite a lot. And so if you were just looking for exact matches, you'd be kind of out of luck. So the algorithms that we developed to do this kind of text reuse detection were foundationally about accounting for the, the uh, um, OCR um, of the systems that we were using. And so um, this is partly how we started to sort of think about OCR as, a, as an, an intellectual problem and how we got um, interested in doing it. This is just an example of like the kind of matching that we're doing, this sort of fuzzy matching of, of text in these archives. So this uh, research that we did together sort of took us in two different directions. For myself, sort of trained as a book historian and um, someone very interested in sort of histories of textual technologies, I got quite interested in OCR as a kind of object of scholarly investigation. And so I published this piece in Book History, which is specifically about like, how do we as book historians think about OCR? Um, part of my frustration that led to this article is that I was noticing that there were all of these talks given at DH conferences, at humanities conferences, where a scholar would get up and at some point would display a slide of dirty OCR like I've just shown you, and everyone would kind of like groan and we would collectively shrug like, what can you do? And we would sort of move on and I felt like there was a real um, block of imagination that was happening. People weren't thinking about, well, what could we do given with those OCR collections or what might might we do to sort of help improve the situation? It was just a kind of like collective apathy that I was getting increasingly frustrated with, uh, with that kind of trope that was happening at all of these conferences. Um, 
And so, yeah, so I, I do this whole thing where I, I look at like the originals and, and how we get from the actual historical newspaper to the, the OCR version of the newspaper that we work with. I talk about the things like inking errors on the page and how those lead eventually to mistranscriptions in the OCR, um, and so on and so forth, right? So this was my interest in it. David's interest branched off in another direction. So I said we were doing all of this work with reprinting, identifying all of these duplicate texts. And what David started to think about was that, um, okay, with any given text, there, there's error introduced by OCR. But if we, in fact, uh, have identified that these 300 texts are matching texts, that they're the same text, that, in fact, we could use that duplication within the archive to do a kind of uh, manual OCR correction, or uh, automatic OCR correction. Right, because the OCR errors will not be identical across all 300 copies. And so he began to experiment with how we could use the, the literary historical work we were doing to uh, feed back into an OCR system and improve the output. So we both got interested in OCR in these really different directions. And this is why we were interested in writing this report. OK, so um, in terms of how we approached the, the problem, uh, there were a few primary uh, areas that we really wanted to focus in on um, in thinking about like what the current state of OCR is and what the future might be. One would be like those newspapers that I was pointing to, right? O OCR was mostly developed and designed to work with um, typeset business documents from, say, 1950. <laughs> That's like the ideal OCR case. And if you're working with typeset business documents from 1950, it's real good. Like you get 98, 99% accuracy with a lot of current OCR systems. One of the places that many in this room will know that it goes wrong is when you have these historical documents that have um, typography that is unique, it is not sort of 20th century typography. Um, there's physical damage on the originals. There's things like those inking errors that I was talking about. Um, and then there's also sort of strange issues of layout um, that are just distinct from those contemporary um, documents that OCR systems were designed to deal with. So this was one of our, our major uh, areas, right? These historical documents that have these unique properties. The other would be documents written in languages that use systems other than Latin script, right? Most OCR engines that exist today were primarily designed for Latin script languages, European languages. Um, but there are a lot of scholars who want to work with documents that are written in those other in other languages. And there's obviously research around this, but like sussing out what that research looks like, who's doing it, um, how it's sort of coming back into these scholarly systems was something we wanted to find out. And the other would be multilingual documents, which is to say documents that have internal movement between languages. Most OCR systems that currently exist are not very good at switching between languages. They get trained on a particular language, and they're not good at sort of this rapid switching. We found there was a community of scholars interested in these kinds of documents, and OCR systems weren't uh, handling it very well. The other part of it, and a really a primary um, motivation for, for writing this report, and this came directly from the NEH and the Library of Congress and the Mellon Foundation in sort of articulating why we should write this report, is a, a sense that there are lots of communities interested in or working with OCR, but that these communities are largely not talking with one another. So we have computer scientists who are researching OCR or, and this is important, related fields that don't get called OCR, um, such as computer vision. So there, um, I'll get to this a little bit more in a second, but OCR in the CS world is largely um, uh, seen as not a really exciting problem. And you'll find that a lot of current OCR researchers in computer science even perceive that their research is not highly valued. But there are actually fields derived from or doing work that I would recognize as OCR um, that are in, in fact quite prestigious right now, like computer vision, like um, the algorithms that try and help an uh, automated car uh, read road signs and things like that, that are identifying text in the world, but it's not sort of OCR. Um, there are library and information scientists who are researching OCR or implementing OCR. There are commercial and nonprofit OCR developers. There are the funders in the humanities, computer sciences, information sciences, and cultural heritage. And then there are the scholars like me that are trying to do text-based research derived from OCR collections. The libraries and archives that manage or, or hold large digitized text collection. And then there are these scholarly societies and advocacy groups. 
And again, you know, the scholars are sitting there bemoaning the, the quality of the OCR, but they're not necessarily talking to the OCR researchers to see what we might do. There are all of these kind of cross conversations that we were hoping this report might help bring together. So the research process was uh, essentially this, right? We, we started with sort of two concurrent um, two concurrent modes of research. The first was we put together an online survey and we simply distributed it out to as many uh, sort of pertinent lists as we, we could. Digital humanities lists, library lists, computer science lists, so on and so forth. Um, we also uh, identified a set of people that we wanted to talk to across the different domains. Um, so people, again, in CS doing OCR research, people doing these kinds of text mining work, um, people who are managing these collections, uh, and we reached out to those folks, we set out up um, interviews. Some of the interviews were one-on-one, -on -one. a lot of the interviews were interviews with teams who were either working on a project or managing a collection. Um, from the interviews, we tried to isolate a set of the primary concerns uh, across those communities with the sort of current state of OCR. The next stage of things is that we started putting uh, people into groups and having virtual group discussions. And one important thing is that in this moment, we transitioned from listing the problems with OCR to articulating what are the interventions that would be significant to your field in terms of OCR. Because uh, we found that people are, are super ready to tell you all the reasons why OCR doesn't work or is bad. Um, it was actually a lot harder to get people to try and imagine what would help. And so the, the working groups were really about trying to get to that next stage. Um, once we had, uh, the virtual working groups had met several times and tried to articulate a set of potential action items, then we convened a workshop of people from each of the working groups at Northeastern. This happened last year um, in February of 2018. Um, while all this was happening, uh, we were doing some experiments with constructing test corpora, uh, collation error modeling. This was the more sort of CS side of things to kind of test some of the ideas that were coming out of some of the working groups. And then uh, the final uh, part of it was that we tried to bring all of this together into the report, which we wrote uh, in the sort of summer and fall of last year and was released in January uh, of 2019, so just a few months ago. This, I wanted to get up here because this was sort of the big question that we put to the working groups. And this really formed how we tried to structure the recommendations in the, the report itself, which was just, uh, we, we got a lot of encouragement from the funders to think in terms of like moonshot ideas was the way that it was often framed. So if you could imagine adequate time, attention, funding, what innovations in OCR would most significantly move research forward in your domain? Right, so if there was this kind of concerted effort, what, what would make a difference? Any questions yet? I'm gonna move and start talking about the sort of individual recommendation, but I've been working in a lab with social scientists for a couple of years now, and they like, like to ask questions in the middle of presentations, so mm -hmm. I've gotten used to it. So I'm wondering if people have questions about the structure, like how we did the research, or any of the kind of early stuff before I transition to the, uh, to the actual recommendations. Okay, great, yes. All right, so, um, all right, so um, the, the report is available online. I'm gonna try to not just like read from the report. Uh, we can have a conversation if there are things that are not clear. I've got a, a few little moments that I'm gonna pull out, but I, I don't wanna read everything. I just wanna say in general, if you look at the structure of the report, every recommendation um, begins with who that recommendation is intended for. Some of them are more aimed at the sort of technical side of OCR. Some of them are more aimed at a kind of like broad funding structures for the research. Um, so we try and identify who is this recommendation for <laughs> and then summarize what the, the sort of action items would be. Um, as we see them. The other thing to say, you'll notice as I go through these recommendations that there's an enormous amount of overlap, right? A lot of these things you would not imagine actually happening in isolation, but these different items would sort of uh, complement each other and we would imagine people proposing projects that would in fact draw from a few of these kinds of areas. Um, and again, I will apologize in advance. Uh, I'm going to do my best to summarize all of these. 
but there are a few that frankly get to the edges of my own uh, expertise and understanding. Um, I, I exchanged a few emails with David in the past week just saying, can you give me like the plain language version of this, <laughs> please? Because that's what I need to communicate to people. All right. So. So improve statistical analysis of OCR output. So where does this come from? This came from initially what I was telling you before, which is that I, I am accustomed to seeing scholars get up and essentially say, the OCR in this collection is too dirty for me to do the research that I want to do. And what we realized as we started to kind of dig into this, that there's a broadly shared kind of anecdotal sense of this, but that there are actually not really great measures for knowing like what level of quality of OCR is sufficient for what kinds of tasks. Which is to say, we have you know kind of decided that for keyword search, fairly dirty OCR is at least acceptable enough to put online and to have people use, right? The, there is dirty OCR underlying all of these huge archives, and we've decided that you know, keywords appear often enough that probably it's sufficient. But actually, we, we don't have really clearly established guidelines for, for even that, and especially not for, OK, well, uh, what is the actual impact of a certain quality OCR on someone who wants to do topic modeling? There's a sense that, OK, that looks too dirty, but we don't actually know. Like, uh, statistically, is it? Can you get anything of value out of uh, OCR that's 70% accurate, 80% accurate? Um, so a lot of this first recommendation is specifically about uh, developing some of these kinds of ways of, of, of talking about or, or assessing what is good enough for what. So a few things. We, we want um, better um, Better models for kind of post correction. I talked about you know David's work in using uh, duplication within the collection to try and clean up the collection, uh, clean up a collection. Uh, there are lots of interesting experiments out there in the world about various models for post correction uh, that use dictionaries, that use whole sentences to try and evaluate the statistical likelihood that it's the right sentence um, and clean it up this way. Um, so a sense of which of those models can be useful and in which collections is, is part of this recommendation. The other big part, though, is that we actually need um, some sense of what is the impact of OCR on downstream tasks, whether that is uh, keyword search, part of speech tagging, topic modeling, word embeddings, so that a scholar who wants to do the research can actually look at a collection and say, um, this should be sufficient or this wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, that's something that is purely anecdotal at the moment. People kind of look at it and have a hunch, but we need better ways of establishing that. And the other part of this is that we need better ways of communicating the kind of um, uh, the statistical impact of OCR errors. So that if I do topic modeling on a collection, I need to be able to say something about what the quality of the OCR might lead us to believe about the reliability of the results. Right? Rather than just saying, ah, it seems kind of fuzzy, it would be good to actually have models for how to communicate that to other scholars who could then decide, well, that seems you know, acceptable or, or not, right? so that we can have a, an actual debate about these things. So, um, so things like, uh, we found that scholars might wish to be able to estimate the, error, the average error rate the distribution of errors across uh, documents in large collections where creating ground truth transcriptions is impossible or impractical. Um, we, we think there are lots of post-correction models that could be used to perform unsupervised estimation of error rates and, and correction. Um, Yes, and ultimately we think that one benefit of this is that it can also contribute to a wider discussion in the humanities around quantitative methods. I mean, this is obviously something that's been, uh, any of you in the DH world know, has been a big topic <laughs> the past week, but uh, it's one of these things that we, we only have a very fuzzy sense about. And so this is our first recommendation. We want there to be something other than a fuzzy sense. I think probably the single, um, the single most cited issue that we ran into as we talked to different scholars was uh, the question of layout analysis, right? Which in some ways um, it, it is a question that's 
prior to the actual OCR, right? Which is just determining when you look at a document, what are the areas that need to be uh, analyzed and sort of transcribed um, so that you don't get, as you sometimes get in uh, historical newspaper OCR, you get the OCR running across the columns rather than sort of identifying the columns, particularly when the columns themselves are not uh, consistent across the whole page, things like that. So we, we heard again and again uh, about layout, particularly from researchers working on uh, non-Latin scripts, historical Arabic, Chinese scripts. They mentioned the unusual layout of their print and manuscript sources as a particular area of, of, a ch of challenge. Um, and even researchers working on unsupervised OCR or computational bibliography, um, such as the folks working on the Ocular Project, if you know about that, mentioned that using simple uh, existing rule-based methods for layout analysis uh, were, were not sufficient to the kinds of work that they were trying to do. Uh, scholars working on critical editions of ancient Greek mentioned the problems of dividing the page into, into text, headers, marginal references, and so on. You think of these really complex pages. Um, so essentially in this section, we survey uh, a lot of research across a bunch of domains, machine learning, neural networks, uh, computer vision again, to mention what I mentioned, what I said before, um, which are these areas of higher prestige in this, in this sort of computer science world that actually have a lot of potential um, application in the analysis of document layout. And, and essentially what we're recommending here is that we need to be finding ways of connecting the scholars doing that kind of computer vision or machine learning work with the scholars with this really interesting historical document data. Because we, we found in talking to those researchers that they are just interested in interesting data. Interested in interesting data. Yeah, that's correct. Um, they want interesting data to work on. They think that a lot of our data is quite interesting, but the sort of channels of connecting these scholars are, are not well established. But if we could do that work, we think that there's a lot of really exciting research that could come out of that. Enormous potential, not much crosstalk. Um, and so that's one of our big outcomes here. And, and to my mind, I'd love for some of the folks doing computer vision to be working on something maybe other than just like reading road signs and stuff. Like there's a lot of other interesting work out there in the world. Okay. Our recommendation number three is exploit existing digital editions for training and test data. So one of the things that we spent a lot of time thinking about is that there has been, over the past few decades in the digital humanities, an enormous amount of work in transcription and encoding and edition building. Things like the TEI, um, at my own institution, there's the Women Writers Project, which is this enormous, long-standing uh, project that's been digitizing the work of women writers from the Renaissance to 1800. Um, there are other projects like the Open Islamic Text Initiative uh, that are doing a lot of this work, but most of these projects, when they do this work, are not thinking about how the manual transcription they're doing might in fact be quite useful as training data for OCR systems that could then be applied to similar documents in other collections. Um, they're not necessarily capturing all of the um, elements about sort of like the um, coordinates of the pages, where they're transcribing from, that would allow that data to feed into a kind of a training model for an OCR system. But there's enormous potential because there are these, so many of these projects out there. And so uh, our, our recommendation here essentially is that um, it's not just, hey, you should be doing this, but that we should have uh, be developing systems for it to make this easy, right? I, I suspect that many folks building those digital editions would not know how to prepare the data in a way that would make it useful for OCR training, but that in fact, if you told them, if you actually just added these fields to your transcription, then this could easily be used to help uh, build a model for early modern OCR, that they would in fact be very willing and excited to contribute to that. And so this is a, this sort of like enormous well of uh, data that's already out there that we think with just a little bit of effort, in fact, could contribute really uh, uh, dramatically to improving OCR models for humanistic uh, materials. Where are we so far? Anyone want to talk about anything we've discussed thus far? All right. This is a long talk. I feel like it's just been me. Um, all right. So um, I just wanted to mention, we, we actually did some experiments with this. Um, 
So the Richmond Daily Dispatch is a, a newspaper that is in Chronicling America. So um, it's, we have the OCR data for a long run of the Richmond Daily Dispatch. But there's also a project at the, the University of Richmond that took an, and manually encoded all of the uh, issues of the Richmond Daily Dispatch between 1860 and 1865. So this is an instance where we have both an OCR version of the data and we have uh, a hand transcribed version of the data. And we were able to do some experiments basically demonstrating how the <coughs> how building a training model on the transcribed data could then be turned to cr creating better OCR data for the other issues of the Richmond Daily Dispatch that were not hand transcribed. So it was a relatively small, um, relatively small experiment, but uh, uh, shoot, I don't have the exact numbers here, uh, but the OCR for the dispatch was able to be improved by uh, more than uh, it, it was like uh, 75 to 80 percent good uh, before, and we were able to get it up to 94, 95 percent accuracy by training a model on the transcribed version, and then applying that model to the uh, the other issues of the same newspaper. Um, we've done some uh, similar experiments with um, sections of. Um, e Ebo and Echo that have been hand transcribed through the text creation partnership. So that's another instance where we have both OCR data and um, hand transcribed data for the same documents. Um, and, and again, we found similar kinds of gains in the OCR when you train a model on the transcribed text and then apply it more broadly to similar documents in the same domain. Um, so uh, we, we feel like this is, uh, has a lot of potential. The other thing that's just worth saying is uh, if, we, if we think about this model, one thing that it relies on is just how much text is actually, in fact, duplicated across these collections. Uh, again, I'm, I'm interested in text reuse. I'll talk about it all day. Uh, but we've looked at things like the data in, uh, we've looked at Google Books data, we've looked at HathiTrust data, and we find that huge percentages of these collections are, are duplicated through quotation, through uh, uh, multiple uh, title being held multiple times. So I think there's actually enormous potential in sort of exploiting duplications of various kinds across our current collections in order to improve uh, OCR. Oh, I don't know why I put this here. This is the work David's been doing on using reprints to kind of um, suss out how to correct a line. So if you know, you can see, right, again, lots of internal difference, but it's different difference um, that you can use to uh, estimate what the line should actually be. So this is, this is related. OK. This is really closely related to number three, which is that we recommend that we need a, a way for people who have ground truth OCR data to contribute it uh, somewhere where people doing OCR research could find it, right? So this is another one of those platform questions. Again, I'm thinking of Kathleen's talk recently. Um, but again, we have, we have these uh, a huge body of these uh, transcription projects, but uh, there's a kind of, um, there's not a clear understanding uh, of how you would get that data to the people who might make use of the data. And so here, what we're recommending is simply that um, such a system be built. Now, there are systems out there that are doing some of this work, particularly in, in Europe. Um, there's the Transcribus uh, platform, which some of you might be aware of. Um, but in some ways, that, that platform is not as community oriented as we're recommending here. So with Transcribus, if you are a scholar, um, you want OCR, you can contribute um, the text, you get OCR back, and they keep the training data for the kind of work that they're doing. What we're imagining is something um, a far more broad and sort of community oriented, where the data coming in and going out is all sort of community owned and, and used. Um, but there is some, some work that we can sort of look to and draw on as we, as we think about this area. All right. So again, we can look at some of the uh, existing platforms out there for doing various kinds of community correction. We think that there's a lot to build on here. But the, the question is how to sort of get this kind of training data that comes out of a project like this one um, and uh, make it more widely available to both OCR scholars and to humanity scholars. All right. But 
that kind of uh, very sort of boutique training is not always possible. And that's what this recommendation is about. So model adaptation and search for comparable training sets. I'm going to do a little bit of reading now, because this is definitely the most David heavy <laughs> recommendation. And this is the one where I emailed him and said, give me language to use, please, David. <laughs> So here's what he wrote, and I think it's pretty good. If you know ahead of time what text you'd like to OCR, you can collect training data for it by transcribing a certain number of pages. So we've been talking a lot about this sort of transcription. But unless you want to commit to manual transcription of a sample of every new text, there will always be new texts that aren't exactly the same as the ones which you've collected tra training data for already. And he's particularly thinking here about really big and diverse collections, where it's not just one domain, but it's lots of books across lots of different domains. And it might be difficult, in fact, to have a kind of hand-transcribed training data set for every possible um, type of book in that domain. So uh, he says, some progress might be made on this problem by matching on metadata fields. So you know taking the metadata field about the genre, say, and, and trying to sort of link that up to a training model. Um, but once you have hundreds of typefaces and book layouts or manuscript hands, it's impractical to have humans select the correct, correct model for each book that you want to OCR. And so what he's proposing here is that we, have, that we work on building automatic processes to select the most appropriate model given the text to be OCR'd from among the models already trained. So here, imagining that we have some kind of repository of different models in different domains, then what we're suggesting is that there need to be methods for, as OCR is happening across a large collection, being able to sort of look at a text uh, make some judgments about what kind of text it is, and then link that up to an existing OCR model to sort of dynamically switch between models as a large collection is being OCR'd. Um, or, he says, building automatic processes to combine the results of several models um, for a given text. So one of the most promising areas that we learned about in computer science for building better OCR is to not run one OCR engine across the collection, but to run multiple uh, OCR engines, and then to essentially bring the results together, right? to have a statistical process to decide which of the results is the best one um, by a voting system, or there's lots of different systems for that. So in this one, um, again, it's a about building that kind of comparison into a more automatic process so that it's not just tailor-made for this collection or that, but can be applied um, more easily. More easily. Um, yep, and actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip his next paragraph because I, I think it's a bit of a side, uh, a bit of a side issue. All right, so this is related to the multilingual um, focus that we wanted to take. So there are some really great projects out there in the world currently that are trying to think through the question of OCR for multilingual uh, collections. So one is the Primeros Libros project um, down in Texas that was working with uh, these, these documents from uh, the, the early, um, early North American sort of colonial period uh, where you have uh, Latin and Spanish and also uh, Native American languages um, that are just constantly interspersed with one another. So in fact, if you were reading down this page, you would see that uh, much of it is in Spanish, but in fact, they transition to several um, uh, Native American, different Native American languages in the space of just one page. And this is the kind of like radical multi lingual text that OCR is very, very bad at working with, or sort of contemporary OCR is very bad with working with. Um, over here, we have um, another example where we have um, mostly uh, German, but we also switch between, between German and Latin French. and French, yeah, again, on the same page. And what's interesting here is you could imagine training a model uh, that looked for the, the, the Fraktur, this German typeface. There's a, an enormous amount of research, in, enormous comparatively, in the, <laughs> in the sense that there's an enormous amount of research on any OCR topic. There's a lot of research on Fraktur, this, this, this font that's used in, in German um, print until the 1930s. Um, but in this case, like the German is in Fraktur, and, but then both the Latin and the French are in Latin script. So you can't quite train the model entirely on the type, typefaces. Um, there's also um, multilingual text even like within a particular typeface. So 
So well, our recommendation here is that we're, we're proposing that the builders of OCR models explicitly develop, train, and test their models on text with mixed languages and a range of historical and dialectical variants. Uh, we're suggesting that the creation of annotated corpora in, uh, in genres that are less likely to occur in modern collections, like dictionaries, critical editions, commentaries, grammatical works, uh, be a kind of focus of some of this research. Um, a lot of this is going to have to fall to the scholarly communities. Like, there are not going to be OCR, like commercial OCR developers who are going to care <laughs> about this. It's not a big enough market. And so this is a place where the scholarly communities interested in these texts are going to have to play a major, major role in doing this. Um, and we, we think that some of these projects, early modern book and manuscript transcription projects in particular, might benefit from following the practice that uh, Primeros Libros has taken on of explicitly modeling orthographic variation and code switching um, within the data. And what we mean by this is um, we're suggesting that in fact we need models that put the weight of the, the sort of uh, interpretation onto the rare embedded languages. So even if this is primarily Spanish, right, it has these native languages in it. And essentially their model is to privilege the native languages in order to transcribe them more accurately, even though that does lead to a slightly less accurate transcription of the Spanish. But we think that we need more models that don't use the dominant language as the sort of primary language in the model in order to improve the, the OCR that's happening in these domains. That, that's a, a trade-off that scholars um, might be able to sort of lead the conversation on, because OCR researchers are not going to probably lead that conversation. Okay, this is probably the most moonshot <laughs> of the moonshot recommendations. Um, but to summarize this, um, obviously the bulk of, o of OCR research has concentrated in the sort of dominant languages and the dominant scripts. Because of that, we became quite convinced over the course of this research that there are domains where an enormous amount of progress could be made in a very short amount of time with just a concerted effort, which is to say, if we could bring together teams of OCR researchers, domain experts who can help with transcription and building training data, um, and the kind of like in, in the infrastructure of, of institutions, um, that there are in fact a, a number of domains where we could see just like an entire uh, phase shift <laughs> in terms of how good OCR is for particular languages or particular periods. Um, and so this is primarily a recommendation to, to funders, but we are essentially uh, saying that the kind, you know, we think of like the, the digital humanities institutes that get funded by the, the NEH, things like that. Um, we think that this kind of like focused concerted effort would, would have enormous uh, consequences. Um, so we don't necessarily uh, single out like which languages or domains, because we could imagine it being either language, like say, Arabic or, or Chinese or ancient Greek, or it could be period, which is to say uh, like 18th century or something like that. Um, but we're, what we're recommending is a kind of like challenge grant program um, that would be aimed at making these kind of substantial uh, improvements. It's going to require the domain experts because a huge part of making this work is going to be uh, enough transcription, like educated transcription work that would uh, establish the training data to make it possible. Um, and so within the period of these institutes, we would want the domain experts to commit to transcribing X amount of data, whatever was sort of sufficient data, um, and then apply that intensive transcription work toward the OCR of uh, text within that domain. And, and the idea here is that like you're, you're buying in essentially. You're committing this much labor in order to get an enormous benefit because like I'll contribute this many pages so that a collection of you know probably exponentially more pages can be scanned and OCR'd with, with reasonable uh, effectiveness. Um, a, a big part of this recommendation is that um, Sorry, I keep losing my place. Doo, doo, doo. A big part of this recommendation is that we think it's going to require a bit more organizational work, uh, perhaps even on the part of the funders, which is to say we don't necessarily think the domain experts know who the OCR people are, who they should be reaching out to. That became very clear over the course of doing these interviews and so on. 
Um, we think there are lots of willing researchers who would gladly jump into such a project on both the humanities and the computer science side of things, but we think that either the funders or institutions are going to have to take a more proactive role in essentially matchmaking uh, because we don't, we, we're not sure that this was just going to happen organically without that kind of, um, without that kind of organizational work happening. We do think the, the potential payoffs are enormous, transformative potentially for scholarly communities who are working with languages or periods that have thus far been little served by OCR development. Um, and at the very least, we think that such institutes would promise to expand the potential for computational research into domains that have been largely also cut off from that, which is to say the digital humanities as largely not, or this branch of the digital humanities. There are large scholarly communities who are, haven't been as much a part of that conversation that could be if they just had the data uh, to work with. Okay, number eight, create an OCR assessment toolkit for cultural heritage institutions. So um, as we were surveying all of these collections, we found there are, you will be shocked to learn that the older a collection is, the worse the OCR is, <laughs> generally. Not exclusively, but generally. Um, and so, like we, there are a lot of collections out there that if we simply like reprocessed all of the images in a collection using a contemporary OCR engine, that the, the quality of that OCR would improve dramatically. I know that you can see this really clearly in Chronicling America. The newspapers that were part of the first round of grants are the worst OCR, and the newspapers that were part of the last round of grants are pretty good, generally, right? Um, and that also means, like painfully for me, that some of the most prominent newspapers in the 19th century were the ones that they digitized first, because they were the ones that all the scholars said, we need to have those digitized. So some of the most important newspapers, in fact, have the worst OCR. The, the New York Herald has the worst OCR, I think, in all of Chronicling America. And it's a really important newspaper. Um, what we found, though, is when we talked with librarians, when we talked with people who maintain a lot of these collections, essentially there was a lot of uncertainty about um, when it would be wise to do a kind of re-OCRing of a collection, what the actual payoff would be, like how much benefit would I actually get from investing in such a thing. Um, there was, a, I think everyone sort of generally knew that OCR has gotten better, but like how to evaluate a collection and determine whether it should be reprocessed was something that everyone was deeply uncertain about, and in the midst of that uncertainty, the decision to do that work is never gonna be made, right? And so our recommendation here is that essentially we need a toolkit, and preferably a toolkit that can be, that can be integrated into the kind of standard institutional um, evaluations of collections and things like that, so that it's, it's just a part of work that gets done as opposed to like an extraordinary extra thing that has to get done, that would enable a, essentially an audit of OCR collections that would simply say, here are the collections you have, you know, using new software would stand to improve the OCR quality by 5% or 20%. And then institutions can make more informed decisions about when it might be worth that kind of investment. Um, at the moment, it's all stagnant, and we think one of the main reasons it's stagnant is because no one really quite understands how to know what, what could be done or why they would do it, it, it exactly. So, um, all right, toolkit. This is, this is the other big collaboration sort of moonshot idea. Um, but there are all of these recommendations in the report that have to do with sharing data, sharing models, uh, sharing best practices, technical best practices. A and in practice, this kind of sharing can impose all kinds of addi additional burdens on existing organizations and projects. So again, I, I'm coming back to everything Kathleen was saying about humanities commons and sustainability, et cetera. So there are lots of projects and organizations that rely on software and computing resources provided by third-party vendors, um, Abbey and other companies that provide um, OCR software. Um, but those systems don't adapt well to the kinds of challenges that we lay out elsewhere in the report. Um, and uh, we don't necessarily want scholars to have to rely essentially on those vendors to sort of help uh, form the kinds of collaborations and, and sharing that we're recommending here. Uh, we don't think that most current vendors are well placed to provide the collective benefits to the research community that we're recommending and, and all of the other um, recommendations in the report, which results in all of these little projects everywhere reinventing the wheel every time that they need to do digitization or work with OCR materials. 
So our last um, recommendation is that we're proposing that some kind of OCR service bureau that would be housed in a library or potentially a related organization, like a professional organization. Um, we've had some conversations with like the Digital Library uh, Federation and Hathi Trust and other about like who would even host such a thing or what it might look like. Um, and this bureau would help with OCR training and evaluation, with sharing of data and models across projects, um, report on evaluations, best practices. They would be the place you would go to find those um, the collection evaluation guidelines, things like that. Um, by hosting data and providing continuity for OCR in these sorts of collections, it would allow for easier collaboration and even easier collaboration between commercial providers. Um, we did find that Google's current OCR is pretty remarkable. <laughs> there was one uh, uh, member of the Google OCR team that was part of this whole project. He was, we interviewed him, he came to our, our workshop. Um, but as always working with Google, like how one actually makes that connection is a pretty murky thing. He was super enthusiastic, but whether Google would be enthusiastic was, it was another question. But we think the OCR Service Bureau could pool, you know, would help pool some of these concerns, so that it's not just one individual scholar, but that it's groups of scholars and that could potentially facilitate some of these conversations facilitate conversations uh, among libraries that are undertaking digitization projects, and then uh, the researchers who are, are making, who are, are using these products. Essentially, what, what's guiding this recommendation is that we need a solution in which contributors have control over the data that they contribute or have some ownership uh, over these contributions um, and the outputs, like what comes out of those contributions. Um, and we need something that works at scale and we need an organization that helps to sort of make that possible. So um, just sort of in wrapping up and then we can, and then we can just talk together. Uh, after the report came out, I wrote this, this blog post which is addressed to my colleagues in English and history uh, and other departments because I think that um, I'm, I'm very unusual in thinking <laughs> so much about OCR. Uh, most, of my, most of my colleagues, what I say, I don't even know that they're aware of the extent to which they interact with OCR, um, the extent to which their research may in fact rely on OCR, um, and the extent to which we need their, both their expertise in addressing this problem uh, in collaboration with these other groups, um, and we need their advocacy as well, because if the people using these databases are not uh, advocating for the kinds of changes that we would want to see, then, then they're not going to happen. So. Um, in that, I'm gonna sort of end with sort of how I ended that piece because uh, I do believe this. So in the recommendations of this report, you will see that the most pressing research in the field is going to require extensive development of training corpora, accurate transcriptions of materials in domains that can be used to train OCR systems. Um, in other words, the most pressing OCR research is going to require the expertise of humanities domain specialists book and textual historians, scholars of languages and writing systems, scholars of particular genres or historical periods. And I quote, uh, one of the people tweeted about the report and said, one sees an entire future of collaborative scholarship here. And I, I agree strongly. There's enormous potential in OCR research for meaningful, important collaboration across a range of fields, but particularly across the humanities, libraries, and computer science. And for me, this is the central reason why humanists like myself should care about OCR, which is not to bemoan its current state, but to imagine its future. And that's what I hope the report will help people begin to do. So now I hope people have questions because we have time.